Welcome to the conference calling center. Please have your passcode and conference okay, leader's name available. A coordinator that. will assist you momentarily. Do me a favor, leave 3535 track for now. Yeah, because somebody's going to come on and talk to me, and I don't want to. Welcome to the conference calling center. Without green, take green in your and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Doing the question and answer session of today's call, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your phone, record your name, and your line will be open. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would like to now turn the meeting over to Mr. Benjamin Hayes. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina, and thank you all for joining us today for this briefing to discuss CDC's latest guidance on recommendations for those who have received the COVID-19 vaccine. We are joined by CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who will provide opening remarks and then be happy to take your questions. This is an on-the-record briefing and not under embargo. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Dr. Walensky. Thank you all for joining us today. 
As you have heard from me previously, this pandemic continues to pose a serious threat to the health of all Americans. I have said throughout my tenure at CDC that our guidance and recommendations will follow the science in our efforts to protect the health of as many Americans as possible. And today, we have new science related to the Delta variant that requires us to update the guidance regarding what you can do when you are fully vaccinated. The Delta variant is showing every day its willingness to outsmart us and to be an opportunist in areas where we have not shown a fortified response against it. This week, our data shows that Delta remains the predominant variant circulating in the United States. Eight in 10 sequence samples contain the Delta variant. In recent days, I have seen new scientific data from recent outbreak investigations showing that the Delta variant behaves uniquely differently from past strains of the virus that caused COVID-19. Information on the Delta variant from several states and other countries indicates that in rare occasions, some vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant after vaccination may be contagious and spread the virus to others. This new science is worrisome and unfortunately warrants an update to our recommendations. First, we continue to strongly encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Getting vaccinated continues to prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and death, even with Delta. It also helps reduce the spread of the virus in our communities. Vaccinated individuals continue to represent a very small amount of transmission occurring around the country. We continue to estimate that the risk of a breakthrough infection with symptoms upon exposure to the Delta variant is reduced by sevenfold. The reduction is 20-fold for hospitalizations and deaths. As CDC has recommended for months, unvaccinated individuals should get vaccinated and continue masking until they are fully vaccinated. In areas with substantial and high transmission, CDC recommends fully vaccinated people wear masks in public indoor settings to help prevent the spread of the Delta variant and protect others. This includes schools. CDC recommends that everyone in K-12 schools wear a mask indoors, including teachers, staff, students, and visitors, regardless of vaccination status. Children should return to full-time in-person learning in the fall with proper prevention strategies in place. Finally, CDC recommends community leaders encourage vaccination and universal masking to prevent further outbreaks in areas of substantial and high transmission. With the Delta variant, vaccinating more Americans now is more urgent than ever. The highest spread of cases and severe outcomes is happening in places with low vaccination rates and among unvaccinated people. This moment, and most importantly, the associated illness, suffering, and death could have been avoided with higher vaccination coverage in this country. COVID-19 continues to prevent, present many challenges and has exacted a tremendous toll on our nation. We continue to follow the science closely and update the guidance should the science shift again. We must take every step we can to stop the Delta variant and end this pandemic. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. Katrina, we are ready for our first question, please.
While we're waiting for our first question, I just want to take the opportunity to let everyone know that if you have questions following the briefing, you please feel free to call our main media line at 404-639-3286, or you can also email those questions to media at cdc.gov. We'll continue to stand by for our first question. Thank you. Our first question comes from Adriana Rodriguez. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I guess the number one question that a lot of people have right now is, you know, what does this mean for vaccinated Americans? You know, who are these guidelines trying to protect if vaccinated Americans um, are not commonly hospitalized or dying from COVID and transmission is not as common? You know, are these guidelines mostly trying to protect them or the unvaccinated? And if it's the latter, then how do these guidelines protect the unvaccinated? Thank you for that question, Adriana. Um, I think the most important thing to understand is the vaccines continue to do an exceptional job in protecting the individual who is vaccinated from severe illness, hospitalization, and death, and even against mild illness, as we have indicated. But your point is well taken. And what um, is different with the Delta variant than with the Alpha variant is that in those cases, those rare cases that we have breakthrough infections, we felt it important for people to understand that they have the potential to transmit virus to others. Now, importantly to convey in all of this is that of the transmission that is happening in the country right now, the vast majority of transmission occurring is occurring through unvaccinated individuals. But on that exception that there, we might have a vaccine breakthrough, we wanted, we thought it was important for people to understand that they could pass the disease on to someone else. And that is important in the case, for example, of a vaccinated individual who might um, be going to visit an immunocompromised family member. We wanted to make sure that they took the uh, precautions necessary to not pass the virus to those. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Hillary Brick. Your line is now open. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to ask, thinking back to um, the pandemic of the unvaccinated you were talking about last week, Dr. Walensky, is, is there a better way to think about the situation when with Delta now? Like, what are you telling your vaccinated friends and family when they go out for dinner, for example? Um, so I think, thank you, Hillary, for that question. I think um, we still largely are in a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The vast majority of transmission, the vast majority of severe disease, hospitalization, and death is, is almost exclusively happening among unvaccinated people, which is why we so very much want to double down on making sure people continue to get vaccinated. That said, um, you know, if you have um, a vaccinated individual who is in a place that with substantial or high transmission, they're contacting a lot of people, um, one in 20, one in 10 of those contacts could potentially lead to a breakthrough infection if you have a, a effectiveness of 90 to 95%. And so that's why we're saying in areas of substantial or high transmission, even if you are vaccinated, that we believe it's important to wear a mask in those settings. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Caitlin Collins of CNN. Your line is now open. Thanks so much, Dr. Wilinski. Two questions. One, you said that you are seeing some people who are fully vaccinated contribute to the spread. Can you say exactly how many people you have seen from this data that are vaccinated that are spreading this? And secondly, when it comes to having everyone, regardless of vaccination status, wear a mask in school, can you explain the thinking behind that? And are you worried that it will take away the incentive for some parents to get their children who are eligible to be vaccinated, vaccinated? Uh, thank you for those questions, Caitlin. Um, first, with regard to your first uh, question, we are now actively um, conducting outbreak investigations of what um, is occurring in places that, that are having clusters, um, and, and many of you are, have heard of many of those clusters. What we've learned in that context is that when we examine the rarer um, 
breakthrough infections and we look at the amount of virus in those people, it is pretty similar to the amount of virus in unvaccinated people. Um, we are now continuing to follow those clusters to understand the impact of forward uh, transmission of those vaccinated people. But again, I want to reiterate, we believe the vast majority of transmission is occurring in unvaccinated people and through unvaccinated people. But unlike the alpha variant that we had back in May, where we didn't believe that if you were vaccinated, you could transmit further. Um, this is different now with the Delta variant. And we're seeing now, now that it's actually possible if you're a rare breakthrough infection that you can transmit further, which is the reason for the change. With regard to schools, um, when we released our school guidance on July 9th, um, we had less Delta variants in this country. We had fewer cases in this country. And importantly, we were really hopeful that we would have more people vaccinated, especially in the demographic between 12 to 17 years old. Next week, we have many school systems um, that are starting around the country. And I think we, we all agree that children less than uh, 11 and less are not going to be able to be vaccinated. And with only 30% 30, 30 of our uh, kids between 12 and 17 fully vaccinated, vaccinated now, more cases in this country, and a real effort to try and make sure that our kids can safely get to back to full in-person learning in the fall. Um, we're recommending that everybody wear masks right now. Next question, please. Our next question comes from John LePook of CBS News. Your line is now open. Hi, Dr. Walensky. Um, some people have asked me, why change mask guidance to protect people who decide not to get vaccinated even though they can? Can you say something about the role the unvaccinated person who gets infected, even if they have mild or no illness, can play in the development of the next variant of concern with that variant potentially going on to have a higher chance of potentially infecting those of us who are vaccinated? Yeah, that's a really important question. Thank you for that. Um, the first thing I think we all need to acknowledge is there, is there are some people who are not able to be fully vaccinated, like children, and some people who are not able to be fully protected, even though there are, they are vaccinated, like immunocompromised people. And um, so, so part of the, the reason for this guidance is to make sure that we can protect those and that people who are uh, seeing immunocompromised people, for example, know how to protect them, even though they themselves may be fully vaccinated. But your point is, well, taken about those who have made the choice to not get vaccinated and, and the amount of virus that is um, circulating in this country right now. So for the amount of virus that's circulating in this country among, uh, largely among unvaccinated people, the largest concern that I think we in public health and science are worried about is that virus and the potential mutations away, we are from a very transmissible virus that has the potential to evade our vaccine in terms of how it protects us from severe disease and death. Right now, fortunately, we are not there. These vaccines operate really well in protecting us about uh, severe, uh, for severe disease and death. But the big concern is that the next variant that might emerge, um, just a few mutations potentially away, could potentially evade our vaccine. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Yasmin Abutalan from the Washington Post. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the data showing that some vaccinated individuals have similar viral loads to unvaccinated, and if you could talk about whether the CDC is looking at expanding the MAP guidance um, to maybe require masking indoors in public spaces in all circumstances or other public health measures given the spread of Delta. Um, thank you, Yasmin. So uh, as I mentioned in these outbreak investigations, we are able to stratify the um, clusters that we are seeing. Unfortunately, because we have so much disease right now, some of these clusters are large and we're able to stratify them by a smaller proportion that are vaccinated and breakthrough infections and a larger proportion that are unvaccinated. And so when we look at their CT values or otherwise their viral load, um, what we're seeing is that they're actually quite similar. That leads us to believe that the breakthrough infections, rare as they are, have the potential to forward transmit at the same 
um, with the same capacity as an unvaccinated person. So the burden is less because there are fewer of them uh, people-wise, but um, the amount of virus is the same between those two strata. Um, in terms of uh, otherwise updating our guidance, we're not looking at that right now. What I will say is if you um, are in a place that doesn't have very much disease out there, obviously I should mention it's always a personal choice as to whether someone chooses to uh, wear a mask or not, and that should not be something that is stigmatized or, uh, or otherwise. Um, but in terms of our guidance, if you have a vaccine that is 90 to 95% effective and you don't have very much disease around, the chance of you getting infected should you meet somebody is, are, is already pretty low. But then the chance that you're going to meet somebody who is um, infected is also pretty low. So we, the, the potential for this to be a problem is much, much lower in areas with low amounts of disease, which is why we really need to work hard to get these areas in the country that have substantial and high amounts of transmission right now down to lower amounts of transmission um, to protect uh, the unvaccinated and get them vaccinated and also to protect uh, the vaccinated. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Julie Sennheiser, a worker. Your line is now open. Thanks. Hi. Um, Dr. Lewinsky, can you tell me whether or not you are intending to start collecting and releasing data on the breakthrough cases? I mean, a while back, uh, you had the CDC announced that they were not going to be, uh, you know, reporting on this data, but it, it looks like the Delta variant is changing the equation in a lot of ways. Uh, when will we start to see those data? Thanks. Um, Julie, thank you very much for that question because I would like to correct a misperception that is out there. The first thing I want to say is we are collecting passive reporting data on people who are hospitalized and who have, have died. But we recognize that epidemiologically, that is not going to give us the best information with regard to rates of breakthrough infection because passive data collection is generally underreported. In order to counter that, we have been collecting data through more than 20 cohorts of people. These include tens of thousands of people who we are following nationwide, and they include health care workers, essential workers, long-term care facilities, and in some of these cohorts, we're collecting PCR data from every person in them weekly. So we are absolutely um, studying and evaluating breakthrough infections in many different sites, many different people across the country. We are looking at those data on a weekly to bi-weekly basis, and we will be reporting on those soon. Okay. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Cheryl Spellberger of the New York Times. Your line is now open. Cheryl, are you there? Katrina, can we move on to the next one and come back to her if she jumps back in? Certainly. Okay. Our next question comes from Andrew Joseph from Stat. Your line is now open. Hi. Um, thanks very much for, for taking my question. Uh, and apologies if you already did this, but can you just sort of define um, how you assess substantial and high transmission? Like if, if someone, you know, reading one of our stories wants to know if, they, if, they, if this applies to them, like, how are they supposed to know what their community level of transmission is and, you know, in turn, like, when they should be wearing a mask and then, you know, maybe if rates fall, when they can kind of get, you know, put them back away? Yeah, thank you for that question, Andrew. So uh, CDC COVID data tracker um, tracks the amount of community transmission by county and is updated daily. It's color-coded, so substantial is orange and high is red. But I will give you, and in fact, um, most departments of public health and, and local jurisdictions track this pretty carefully as well. We can get you the link, of course, to find the data. Um, but the important thing I uh, want to continue is what it means. Um, substantial transmission is areas that have 50 to 100 cases per seven days, uh, cases per 100,000 over a seven-day period. And substantial is uh, places that have more than 100 cases per in a seven-day period per 100,000. So um, I, 
I do want to sort of articulate that, that we have places and counties and states here that are now reporting over 300 cases per 100,000 over a seven-day period, so really an extraordinary amount of viral transmission, which is what we're concerned about. Next question, please. Okay, our next question is Cheryl Stahlberg. Your line is now open. Okay, can you hear me now? I can, thank yeah, you. We have you. Okay, that's great. Thank you for taking my call. I am wondering if given what you now know about the Delta variant and the transmissibility, if the CDC is giving any thought to recommending vaccine mandates, for instance, of the federal workforce or of the military, which President Biden uh, could impose, or mandates perhaps for schools or employers? Um, thank you, Cheryl. So that is not something that the CDC has jurisdiction over. Um, we certainly will be technical advisors to the government as they're making these decisions. Um, what I will say is that um, we are working, uh, we are recommending that communities um, look to their community levels and really look to what would motivate their communities to um, help get vaccinated. If businesses believe that it would be um, a mandate, then we encourage them to do so. We're encouraging uh, really any activities that would motivate further vaccination. Not all communities are going to be responsive to a mandate in the same way. So we're really encouraging communities to look to their own areas and see what would be most motivational to get vaccinated. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Asal Ahmed of AFP. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, Dr. Walensky, high caliber masks because um, in areas where um, there's low vaccination rates well, I, one would expect that you know mask adoption would also be low and in order to sort of maximize personal protection are you emphasizing n95 masks over cloth and surgical thank you Thank you, Asad. Um, right now, we're really motivated to get people masked to prevent transmission. Um, if people have a personal choice as to whether they, they have access to and want to wear an N95, I'd leave that to their personal decision. The CDC does have guidance as to um, what are the best masks to wear, um, multi-layer cloth masks, uh, surgical masks. So so we're, we're leaving that to the, the CDC guidance on, on masking. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Mahoney of KMB CTV. Your line is now open. Very good. Thank you very much. Doctor, um, given uh, the definitions that you've had here of uh, high and substantial tra transmission, and I understand that you're doing it uh, county by, by county, would you consider much of the state of Missouri now as uh, in a high or substantial transmission and subject to uh, the recommendations that uh, CDC is making this afternoon? And are some of the clusters that you're investigating also in the state of Missouri? Um, I... Uh the state of Missouri, um, I'm, I'm actually just even looking, but my understanding is the state of Missouri is largely classified as um, high or substantial, if not entirely classified. It's not entirely, but it's largely classified as uh, substantial or high, with, with a few exceptions in the counties. Um, and uh, we are collaborating with the state um, when they ask for assistance related to uh, outbreak investigations. Katrina, we have time for two more questions, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jonathan Wilson of San Diego Youth Union Tribute. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you for taking our questions. I guess one of the big you know, outstanding questions here is, is how much compliance we may get from, you might expect to get in terms of folks uh, masking up indoors. Have you done any type of modeling work to get a sense of if you get a certain percent compliance, whether that would be sufficient in helping to drive down cases at this time. Just curious about that. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we work together. Thank you. Um, we work together with numerous modeling groups. I, I don't specifically know which ones might have examined that. So I, I think I should probably refrain from asking that right from uh, answering that right now. I, I suspect that one of the modeling groups has examined this question. I really do believe that um, 
masking right now, um, especially for those unvaccinated, is um, the temporary measure. What we really need to do to drive down these uh, transmissions in areas of high transmission is to get more and more people vaccinated and in the meantime to use masks. Last question, please. Our next question comes from Kimberly Russell. Your line is now open. Okay, Kimberly has disconnected. If if I may, may I just have one sort of closing remark? Absolutely. Um, thank you. So I just want to indicate um, that this is not a decision that we or CDC have made lightly. Um, this weighs heavily on me. I know 18 months through this pandemic, um, not only are people tired, they're frustrated. We have mental health challenges in this country. We have a lot of continued sickness and death in this country. Our health systems are in some places being overrun for what is preventable. And I know in the context of all of that, it is, um, not a welcomed piece of news that masking is going to be a part of people's lives who have already been vaccinated. Um, so it, this, this new data weighs heavily on me. This new guidance weighs heavily on me. And I just wanted to convey that this was not a decision that was taken lightly. Um, public health experts, scientific experts, medical experts, when we, when I shown them these data, have universally said that this required action. Um, I saw it and I felt it when I saw the data myself. So I just wanted to perhaps close and say that this was not something that we took lightly and something that I know weighs heavily with me and with all of America. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. And thank you all for joining us today. Like I've mentioned earlier, if you have any additional questions, please call our media line at 404-639-3286 or you can email media at cdc.gov. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our conference. You may all disconnect. Thank you for your participation.